um, and that celebrates the artists in the hood. Uh, so, that's what we do. Uh, and we're happy to have you here. Thank you so much for coming. And then it is really my pleasure to introduce Richard Arredondo, who's going to talk a little bit about his work, and then Gilberto will talk about uh, the missions. Two great graduates, if you could speak first and I'll okay. talk about okay. that. Right. Well, thank you for coming, and uh, I hope you're enjoying my work. Uh, very unique, the missions. Uh, and I just mentioned I'm going to be talking about my work after Dr. Hinojosa's presentation. It was my pleasure to introduce Dr. Hilberto Hinojosa, who is a professor of history at the University of Front Word. He has done exten extensive research on the original documents of the missions. Dr. Hinojosa. <laughs> Uh, the reason I, uh, I uh, upstate standard was to go first is because I think if we uh, think about this work and look at it uh, afterwards, uh, after considering what the faith communities were about, I think we'll have a fuller, uh, a fuller vision of that. Uh, we'll begin with the, uh, try to deal with the, 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 the the content or the context of where these uh, missionary and Indian towns uh, took place. Uh, we see, of course, the, a, a nice uh, uh, map here of, of North America and uh, the uh, arrival of Native Americans uh, to North America approximately 15 to 40,000 years ago uh, in probably one, or excuse me, two or maybe even three migrations across the Bering Strait. Uh, the, uh, the, the different climate changes created land area so that they could cross. Some came possibly with by canoes and, and traveled uh, to the southern parts of South America uh, before the, actually some of them migrated into South, into South America. As for North America, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Mesoamerica here uh, because that is very much a part of the location of the Spanish conquest. And we'll see what Native Americans here were doing and how the Spaniards interacted with them. And it set their expectations to interact with the uh, other groups here in the, in the rest of North America. We see some of the names, uh, certainly there were uh, dozens more nations or groups of, of Native Americans in the vast uh, northern part of, of the continent. This part of the, of the continent here in Mesoamerica uh, was the area inhabited uh, in the, uh, by the time the Europeans arrived here uh, by people living in towns. A really important, it's a really important fact of the, of the issue related to the exhibition here. The Native Americans were living in towns, and from those towns and city-states uh, developed an empire that uh, conquered those towns, brought them together uh, politically and economically. Uh, and this is the area that the Spaniards arrived to uh, in the uh, in the, for, in the late 1400s, of course, in the Caribbean, and then in the 1500s uh, to the continent. We see some of the uh, vestiges of those empires in, 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 in Tenochtitlan, Teotihuacan, rather, uh, and, uh, and we can have some kind of image, uh, just to recall, the, I'm sure you've seen pictures of the pyramids in central Mexico, the fact that we have uh, uh, developed empires that created the cent central uh, religious and economic and political centers. Uh, basically, at the bottom of those empires, or at the base of those empires, was the Indian town. And this is critical for what we will experience later on here in the north, given the Spanish first experience with those Indian towns. Uh, and in those Indian towns, we have uh, Native Americans living in, in permanent housing, uh, having an agricultural base, farms. Uh, and in fact, the Aztec Empire, the Mayan Empire, 
were really agricultural empires. Uh, and uh, the, uh, they, they had extensive agriculture, uh, huge farms, uh, and uh, the, uh, those, the imperial center coordinated uh, the transportation of different uh, agricultural products, products in the uh, products in the area, and of course became the, the political center. Uh, for functioning of the town, there was a cacique or a town leader. I hesitate to call them chiefs because of our American concept of chiefs uh, is not the town leader that we see in Mesoamerica, but really basically battle chiefs. And so the Native Americans, most of them had not developed towns. There were some towns uh, along the Mississippi, the Mount Builders, uh, and so on. But those had come and gone, and uh, very significant, uh, some in New Mexico, of course, as well. And central to the town was the town pyramid. So we can see the town and then central, uh, and at this point of Rome, uh, the town pyramid uh, as, uh, as a religious center. And there's a whole complicated uh, explanation of how the the towns uh, sometimes became regional capitals, and then how those regional capitals developed into empire, imperial capitals. But at the, at the basic function is this town uh, where the uh, Native Americans lived on permanent housing, agriculture, with the town leaders command of regional relationship, the anthropologists called. And very central to all of this uh, is the role of religion. Difficult for us to understand because we have basically a secular society that doesn't see how religion permeates all activities as they did in these uh, Native American towns. <clears throat> the Spanish conquest in, uh, in uh, 1521 uh, was of this area here in Mesoamerica. America. Uh, as you know, the Spanish thought they had gold and silver. It turns out they didn't. And so they, they toppled the Aztec Empire, and then they discovered that they didn't have the gold and silver they thought they had. And so they said, well, what do we do? Well, it was really simple. They said, well, what did the Aztecs do? Well, they had an empire of land and labor uh, and that was based on these towns. And interestingly, the first thing after they discovered there wasn't gold and silver like they had dreamed of, uh, they went to, to the room where the uh, controller or the treasurer had the maps of the most uh, fertile and the biggest and the most important and the most productive towns uh, and so on. So it's a, a town, an empire of land and labor of Indians that the Spaniards uh, established basically for the first century. Uh, rather complicated later on developed into this whole area of New Spain. Uh, what about the Indians living in those towns? Well, we have very clearly, uh, they were organized as state communities. Uh, the, the role of the local, of the, of the town, the god or goddess of that town, uh, ruled the daily lives and it's, it's responsible for the agriculture, responsible for birth and death, responsible for uh, sickness and health, responsible for the changing of seasons, and so on. In a way in which we who have you know, divorced the divinity from nature uh, failed to see. Uh, I have some students who, uh, I remember one as I taught at UTSA for a long time, and a student who was very nervous about his very, very smart student, uh, very nervous about, he was about to graduate, and very nervous about passing the course, and, uh, and that final exam, and I, and I told him, well, I, I tell you what, I'll, 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 I'll wait the final exam if you go to the to Friedrich Park and spend an hour listening to the trees. I'll take the exam. <laughs> it's just, we were divorced from nature to that point. I know we have a built environment that permeates uh, everything. Uh, even even the little uh, linear parks where I walk, um, you know, people don't believe me that I get out there at 6.10 when you have the first light and the birds begin singing. 
You know, they stay for about half an hour. They don't see the whole board. They stay for about half an hour. And so it was delightful, but folks, since you get up and get out there at 10, 6, 10, it's worth it. But nobody believes it. Uh, and then, so they're not, they, they, don't, they don't have this system. Uh, we have moved away from this religious system. Uh, and of course, they have uh, the belief system, which was inclusive. And that is that they were, they, they were open to other gods that could prove themselves to be more powerful, and so on. So it kind of meshed with Catholicism that accepts, you know, cultural differences. After all, Jesus was a Jew. That's how come we don't understand Paul's writings, you know? It just goes, what he's talking about? Because he's immersed in culture. Uh, and that's what the meaning of the, of the incarnation. The fact that, that Salvation is that communal salvation. That, that uh, Christ didn't come to save you or you or you or you or you or you or you. He came to save us. In fact, if you notice, we pray to our Father and give us this day our daily bread. Very communal. And of course, sacramental rituals and so on. Which of course, the, in the Reformation, they got the point as being, uh, as being uh, um, you know, uh, uh, myths and so on, but the, the very visual practice of religion uh, and so on. The community of saints uh, is another factor that uh, that has been lost in the in, in the process of uh, this uh, individualism of the modern era. As we hear, you know, Jesus is my personal savior, uh, which is true, but. There's more to it than that. Uh, it's it's a, basically he came to save the people of Israel. He came to save the community, uh, and so on. So Mary and the saints, all these, they're close to God. They're humans. They're happy. They're they're uh, set apart from us, uh, almost gods themselves. And so Catholicism was open to the Indian uh, practices, and uh, and so. Uh, it was easy for the Catholicism to match with the uh, with the Indian beliefs and practices and so on. Uh, the Protestants tend to look at it and dismiss it as items behind altars or something to that effect. Instead of seeing a blend of faith, a blend of religion, a blend of cultures, uh, and so on. This is as much prayer as you know, as singing uh, a mighty fortress is our God, uh, and so on. It's difficult for uh, this world to understand that. So if, if it was going to be, if Catholicism was going to be theirs, it had to be, uh, it had to be theirs in their language, and so on. We forget that the, the Gospels themselves were written in Greek. They had moved away from from uh, the world of Hebrew speaking to the world of Greek speaking. And uh, some concepts introduced by Paul or even, believe it or not, or even Greek concepts. Uh, so so they, it really it has to be a part of culture. Uh, it's, of course, uh, very evident in, in, uh, in traditions like Guadalupe, uh, which have the Blessed Mother being very Mexican. And, uh, and so this is like, wow. Well, you know, if you talk about it, the Blessed Mother in Fatima is very French. And the Immaculate Conception is very Greek, and so on and so forth, you know. Uh, it really has to be a part of culture, uh, uh, and so on. Well, so much for Central Mexico or Mesoamerica, and so on. Once the Spaniards discovered silver in the north, now they had to deal with Indians that were different from the ones in Mesoamerica. These Indians were hunters and gatherers, very different from the Native Americans in Mesoamerica. How to deal with it? Well, Spain was not prepared with an army to conquer them, uh, like the U.S. Army of the West, you know, with forts and Indian wars and stuff like that. Uh, so they. Uh, move north and they're going to deal with Native Americans by creating missionary-led Indian towns. 
I no longer call them missions, I call them missionary-led Indian towns. Missionary-led Indian towns. Of course, you say that 50 times, you're going to call them missions. Uh, so missionary-led Indian towns. These are basically Indian towns. The missionaries didn't know how to, how to deal with Native Americans except with the model they had seen before of Native Americans living in towns. So they, they, they had no other concept of how do we deal with Native Americans. Here, economically, down here in Mesoamerica, economically, politically, socially, religiously, they had dealt with Native Americans living in towns, and by golly, they were going to create towns up here. And so you have the creation of missionary led Indian towns. Along with them came soldier settlers who were involved in towns called presidios and civilian towns as well. And so the, 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 the Spaniards uh, were interested in the, the missionary led Indian towns were developed across the north and finally into Arizona and then of course into California and New Mexico. It's a different story altogether. And, and they moved to East Texas, uh, but the Native Americans in East Texas uh, were actually not just hunters and gatherers, they had, they were also gardening, namely they had crops such as corn and wheat and beans and squash and so on, with small, not that huge fields like in central Mexico, but to the extent that it made them basically settled Indians in villages. They already had permanence, they didn't, the Spaniards weren't offering them anything new. They already had food security. And additionally, they were trading with the French with furs uh, and, and doing quite well. And so they didn't move into missionary led Indian towns like the, like the Native Americans in Central Texas uh, who were hunters and gatherers. Uh, these folks were, were, uh, were just like other Indians in the north and so on who were hunters and gatherers. Uh, and of course, they had developed their own techniques of, of living. The greater San Antonio area, uh, there was the, and in fact, at Incarnate Word, uh, there was a, an area of Incarnate Word near the Blue Hole, which is one of the main springs, where if you walk along the, the lawn, you go, you just, uh, and several times in the year, you're, you're going squish, 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 because there's you know, hundreds of little springs of water coming out. Uh, even as late as the 90s, when I first got there, I remember this uh, vividly, uh, and so on, with the, with the number of Senate inhabitants in San Antonio, and all the asphalt and all the lawns that we have to water, uh, you know, we don't have that, uh, those springs bubbling up as, as they were. Um, so there were uh, several dozens of groups that gathered around the San Antonio River, uh, particularly near the headwaters, and, and traded goods they had gathered in different parts. San Antonio is located in the, in the, in the corner of three or four major different, uh, major different uh, geographical areas where Native Americans could harvest different kinds of, 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 uh, of, of uh, animals and, uh, and nuts and fruits and so on, and they would gather around the San Antonio River for certain uh, celebrations. Well, the missionaries called them together and said, well, look, you know, as, as good as life is, you still experience, you know, food insecurity. And you come into these towns and we'll show you how to farm. And you will never be hungry again. There were other reasons why they came to be sure, but this was the main one. And you can tell that this was the main one, and this is what this, you know, town building was all about. If I ask you, what do you think the first building was that went up? It's when the missionaries started building these towns. Oh, it's oh, so good in there, serving my sense the church. It's wrong, a storeroom. Grammar. A storeroom, a grammar. Because the missionaries had brought in supplies for the Native Americans while they cleared the fields. And so the second building. A bigger storeroom. I mean, what is this <laughs> And the third building, a really big one, a really big storeroom. And one of those other little storerooms became a church. 
And then when the town became prosperous enough to, to have the labor and so on available, they began actually building those churches. The church at, uh, two very good examples, the church at uh, San Jose and the church at Concepcion are actually the second church, or it could actually be the third or maybe even fourth church. And the one near next to it, and, and Father David, he's not here this afternoon, so I can criticize him. He calls it the sacristy. That little, room, that little place next to the church at Concepcion was the previous church before they built the big one. And you can see how small it was and why they needed to build the big one. The same thing happens at San Jose, that beautiful little church uh, next to the big, the big church. Uh, was a church before they built the big one. And so, you know, they, they, they created these towns uh, based on agriculture, uh, as we'll see, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and ranching, and did quite well. Now, as far as what the missionaries challenged or set out to do, is they actually were setting out to change the Native Americans. They wanted to change them from nomads, to settle the Indians. They wanted to uh, sell them from a, from a band with ambivalent family relationships and so on to nuclear families. Why? Well, that's the model they had seen in Mesoamerica. And that's the model you have once you have fully agricultural societies and so on. The Native Americans, hunters and gatherers didn't have that family model. Uh, they, wanted to, uh, they, they, they wanted to change the world view, obviously, from uh, spiritual, spirit, animistic spirit seekers to a world view of uh, Christianity. Uh, and they, uh, they attempted to change their language as well, because there were many groups, we'll see, they try to create a public technical language uh, of their own. Uh, and so they created these communities the missionary-led Indian towns. Uh, and uh, what were they doing? Well, farming. Really important, they had to make a living. So you, we, faith permeated everything, and it's emphasized in these beautiful paintings, and so on, but it permeated all of life. It permeated the, the, the rising, the beginning of the day, it permeated the celebration of the seasons, and so on. Uh, and they try to make the, the Christian God a permanent God that, that was the God of everything, a God of uh, the morning and a God of the evening, a God of the spring and a God of the summer, uh, and so on. And, and so they went with the seasons and the church cycles uh, and so on. To create these farms, of course, they needed, uh, they needed a dam because this is actually a semi-arid land. And, and, and these were significant uh, 50 miles of irrigation canals across San Antonio, huge, hugely important. And of course, ranching uh, for income generating. They continue to be there uh, in spirit. Just don't tell the National Park Service I stole it from the movie. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful movie, of course. Now, uh, they, it involved, you know, a change. Uh, down here where the Oficinas, oficios, are the workshops, basically. Uh, and then up here were the boarding school in order to change the next generation. And of course, the central role of faith in everything that they did. Uh, the many groups that we heard, some of them had very distinct languages, some of them had related dialects. Uh, the missionaries figured out a, uh, a common language among them that the missionaries called Pogwentekens. Uh, and was a step into uh, to learning Spanish. Uh, they were they had to deal with uh, a different uh, calendar, a calendar uh, marked by the moons, uh, and 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 then they had to deal with the fact that you know the the spirits were very much a part of who they were. They continued to be a part of, and it's interesting that the missionaries were always worried about it, which meant it was still there. So the missionaries write, you know, we tried our best, but you know, they talk about, you know, what did the owl, you know, or any other birds tell you, uh, and so on. So, he, you know, these missionaries, you know, were 
didn't quite realize, didn't quite appreciate all those birds singing at 6, 10 in the morning on, at Leon Creek in my little park. It's my park. It's not yours, it's mine. And, uh, and so they, they asked for these, you know, uh, how, how, do you, how do you deal with them? Well, obviously they weren't as successful as they hoped to be. As simple as that little wonderful clip, you know, makes it, you know, this, this uh, the guy in the, uh, in the ironworks, you know, uh, banging out the, the previous culture. It didn't quite happen uh, as easily. Some never uh, assimilated. Uh, there's records, uh, for example, that show that in some of the towns, uh, they, they were actually temporary camps for the, for the Native Americans. They came, they stayed there for a few weeks or months, and then they went and did their rounds and so on, and maybe at the same time make sure they'd come back to the missionary led Indian towns. So they were obviously seeking, you know, their own goals, not just the goals of the, of the friars. Uh, the friars complain about the fact that, that, that you know, the, the friar, you know, uh, goes to bed at certain times of the, uh, at, at the usual time every year, but at certain times of the year, uh, that actually they sneak out of the missionary that they get down to do Indian dances and worship dances and so on. So it's not quite as full as, a, as the missionaries uh, uh, did. And some of Native Americans abandoned the towns altogether. So it's not, the, the, the missionaries had their own objectives, but so did the Native Americans. And how they blended with the old and the new uh, and so on is difficult to ascertain in any one instance. We see some of the paintings where they're carrying out, obviously, Christian rituals, like in Besame, where they're carrying out the body of Christ uh, on Good Friday. And then we see some other paintings where they have fires and so on, very likely right in those towns, uh, celebrating Native American traditions uh, and so on. So it's actually a little more complicated, uh, and the paintings capture that in different ways, which I thought was just great. Uh, and I always admire artists. I, I, I have a daughter who's an artist in, uh, in, who sings and dance and dances. Uh, the other one is an attorney who married another attorney. May God have mercy on their eternal souls. But, uh, the one that's an artist, you know, in, uh, uh, paints and draws and writes and sings and dances, all the things I wish I could do and, and I would do if I were in some kind of you know, reincarnation, which isn't going to happen, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, the other two towns, uh, the Villa de San Fernando for civilians and the Presidio de Reja for the soldier settlers, also play an important role here in our, in our area. And, and here we have, very interestingly, at the, at the, in, in San Fernando town, we have the, mer the merging of these two towns, the Mexi Mexican or Mestizo soldier settlers and the Canary Islanders uh, eventually blending in together. The soldier settler town was behind San Fernando Cathedral, but it's now San Fernando Cathedral, which used to be the church of the town. And the civilian town for the Canary Islanders were, it was in front of the, of the town. The, the, uh, the cross, there's a cross in, inside San Fernando that marks the door of the old of the old church and that was the center of the town. The town was measured X number of varas from there north and south and east and west uh, and so on. And the church bells rang all, like in the missionary land in the towns, the church bell rang for important events, deaths, uh, alarms, arrivals of meetings and so on. The Canary Islanders, just like in the mission, celebrated uh, uh, well, Lupe, and here they also celebrated La Candelaria, which is the Spaniards that brought in. Also, mixing cultures in the little weather. Uh, the faith communities in San Fernando that we have a very good record, like we have in the missionary and the Indian towns. Uh, faith rituals mark individuals, things in people's lives, births and deaths, and, and uh, quinceañeras, and uh, uh, marriages and, and, and so on, different events in people's lives and in view with of the faith uh, and so on. 
The, actually, in the town, we have natives born uh, priests, uh, whereas the missionaries came from Spain. So we have a, a more a different kind of blending taking place. Uh, the missionary lady in the town is faded, uh, epidemics, some Native Americans joined the Norteño bands. The, so the towns were finally disincorporated, which is what the meaning of secularized. Uh, and the lands were divided among the former town dwellers. Uh, and there's still some people living around the, the missionary land in the towns, particularly the, the farm of uh, uh, San Juan and, and uh, in San Francisco, the Espada, uh, and so on, and even San Jose, and even some around Concepcion, uh, who were the uh, descendants of the original dwellers of those towns. Uh, so those communities persist in some way or another. Eventually, of course, the center of the Tejano community became San Fernando de Beca, San Antonio, and, and some of the missionary Indians that lived in those missionary land Indian towns moved into the central city. Uh, uh, they had their own barrio. Uh, there were also Native Americans of the Latinos. Uh, and again, uh, San Fernando, like uh, the missionary land Indian towns, were uh, uh, not, you know, it, it, they, they of course had to do the kinds of things that people have to do, namely make a living, uh, and so on. But the issue that, the, the thing that is different is the process of making a living, uh, the divinity permeated, uh, the, it, it, it marked the, the days, the months, the celebrations uh, of, of the individuals and families and so on. So it's kind of different from our secular life and the, the paintings, in, you know, beautifully uh, capture some of the essence of, uh, of the faith of those missionaries that have been housed. Uh, and while I can give you a lecture and so on, I cannot impress you the way the paintings do. Do you want to tell them, uh, one of the things that always impressed me that I discovered was when the, how long the missions existed. Uh, okay, uh, what year, what year? Well, the, the first establishment, of course, we just finished celebrating the tricentennial. The first town was San Antonio de Valero, which became, eventually became the Alamo. And that was founded uh, in 1718. And in one or another was founded in 1718 as well. Uh, and then in the 1720s, uh, by the 1721, I think, all five were established. And then in the end of the century, uh, late 1700s, early 1800s, they were disincorporated. So basically, they existed for, uh, for a century. Uh, and they continued to exist uh, in the sense that when they were disincorporated, the lands were distributed among the remaining town dwellers, and they kept coming to the same churches uh, that they had gone before. It had been the center of their town life, uh, and it continued to be active. Thank you. Yes, question, yes, question. How did the missionary life The, the North American Indians that we're familiar with in our U.S. history were, were the same as these hunters and gatherers. Yeah, well, why, why did they, you know, have a different way of life? Yeah. They had the same way of life. They had the same way of life. Hunters, oh, 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 geographical, environmental region, you had, in the north, you had generally semi-arid lands. So you couldn't have farms. So they didn't develop agriculture. The extensive agriculture that was developed was in the central part of the continent along the Mississippi Valley, and that's where you had the mound builders. And those, and those Indians developed towns just like the ones in Mesoamerica. Uh, they, were, they weren't stone uh, pyramids, they were earthen pyramids. But they were huge. 
there were Chikova was a huge town, uh, imperial center, uh, and so on. And like other empires, we've heard of the coming and going of the Mayan Empire. Well, this empire in, in Central, in the Mount Builders, they went and came. Basically, they over the area, the, the rulers become di dictatorial, depending too much, and so on. And they go back into living in towns and in villages. Basically, the fact that you had all these forest lands and so on, developed a lot of hunting that gave sustenance to life and didn't necessitate farming like it did in Mesoamerica. Sure. Right. Uh, did not really have a family structure? They didn't have the nuclear family structure that, you know, the child is raised by the whole village, this kind of thing. Everybody was related. You didn't, uh, you didn't have the father, mother's child, you know, unit kind of thing. They lived with cousins and so on, all together. Uh, and, uh, it's, it's, they didn't think in the terms of nuclear families. We have to ask the artist questions, yes. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I had heard that when the conquistadores uh, came to this area, that there were 10,000, approximately 10,000 indigenous people along the banks of the San Antonio River. It's quite that possible. It's quite possible. Uh, it's a huge, uh, it, they, they may not have been uh, living there permanently. These were all hunters and gatherers. But on uh, one particular season, seasonal times of the year, they would all gather as a, the center of the river function as a training center and also as a worshiping center. Uh, but uh, all the way across, even as far as San Marcos uh, as well, another area, uh, you, we've heard of the, the, the the springs of San Marcos, you know, and so on. It was, uh, that's another, uh, the, I believe the springs of San Marcos uh, are, are eventually got to be bigger because they bombed the spring out. You know, and, and the water just came out on its own. And that the indigenous people were uh, sent to the different stone quarries, natural stone right. quarries in the area to build a mission. That yes, correct? that's correct. Uh, it's, it's all limestone. Uh, when they rebuilt San Jose, they used flagstone. The, the folks that rebuilt it, they did pretty well given the documents that were available to them. Uh, but they used flagstone because limestone takes a lot of care. Limestone uh, soaks up the humidity pretty fast. And typically, the limestone needs a, a layer of uh, it's adobe or something, plaster. Uh, plaster. Some kind of adobe or plaster to keep the moisture from eating up the stone. And, and that would have taken a lot, of, a lot of care to rebuild the walls and so on to, with that. But it was all limestone, yeah. And, uh, it, it's, uh, but the San Antonio River, uh, you have to see it. It's difficult to, to conceive that. And also San Pedro Springs. Uh, which is also between the San Antonio River and the springs at the, at the San Antonio River and the springs at San Pedro. Uh, and uh, they, then, of course, uh, I was complaining in one class at, ages ago about who ever thought about building a highway over the San Pedro you know, Creek, which was so important in the 1700s. And, uh, and, and, uh, and of course, having, you know, I'm a graduate from UT. So I said it was highway engineer from Texas A&M. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Anything that goes wrong with the highway is their fault. Well, who knows, of course, it's, it's, it's unverified. <laughs> well, the son of the head engineer was in the office. <laughs> so, in any case, yes. So when you say disincorporated, how does that relate to the church and its use as a yeah. parish? These were towns, and they had legally they were towns. They were towns. And, and then they became parishes like any other parish. But these were, and for example, any time they talk about the chapel at the Alamo, I cringe. That was not a chapel. That was the town church. 
See, a chapel is a private place of worship. A church is the community center. And that was the church of San Antonio de Valera. And so, and, and then they became parishes. You know, they began to function as neighborhood churches. But, you know, once again, uh, this, uh, all this is heavy stuff. The real impression is by uh, seeing, uh, gazing, and soaking these beautiful images. In. Thank you for your, com your compliments. Or any of um, People ask me why the missions? Why did I, why did I start doing the missions? Well, to begin with, uh, I have this special affection for San Antonio and ancestry and my family who's been here in San Antonio since the 18th century. My great great grandmother was 13, was born in 1823, was 13 years old during the time of the Alamo, and already living here. Some people ask me, when did your family come over? So, well, we were taken over by the North. So, but uh, I've always had this uh, affection for the missions. Also, my uh, Catholic church upbringing. Uh, I, at one point, we even asked Linda Massingale, we were childhood friends. Uh, I even had aspirations of being a priest at one time, at a very young age, anyway. But um, well, that's one of the reasons for doing the missions. And then, of course, uh, I started drawing churches when I was going to school in Mexico and utilizing this technique of pinning and markers. Uh, and this is like the church in, on a pyramid in Mexico. So I started using that technique uh, for, for illustrations of this sort. But before that, people asked me, why, why markers? Well, I'm a graphic designer, and I worked in advertising graphics for a long time, way before I taught at San Antonio College for 30 years. And back then, before computers, um, advertising layouts were done by hand with markers. And uh, that's my piece of ground, I can tell you. <laughs> I know it from that, that, that time period. Uh, so at one point, I learned to uh, all these tricks and blending and with the pen and ink uh, for these illustrations. And so eventually, when I went back to San Antonio, I, um, I did San Jose Mission in 1984. There's an illustration with all this foliage. I don't have it here. Uh, my first mission of San Jose when I did this, uh, this technique. Well, in the 2000s, I started to do the missions again and bring back that, that illustration technique with pen and ink and markers, but this time on mylar. Uh, and then I started first seeing, well, you know, the 300th birthday is coming of San Antonio, the tricentennial. And it occurred to me that I should explore having a, an exhibit um, so I started illustrating some of the missions and um, uh, exploring how an exhibit. Last year, oh, last early 2018, I asked Kellen McIntyre, the director, might you have a slot for me because uh, I wanted to have a show in, in conjunction with the Tricentennial, especially with the missions having become a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And that was another reason for my illustrating the missions. Uh, but Kevin said, well, everything's filled up for 2018, I'll, I'll give you something in 2019. In the meantime, I had uh, a friend who was on the board at the Mission Library, where she said, we can have a show here. So I had uh, a small show there in October in conjunction with 2018, 2017, et cetera, et cetera. And those missions were only the buildings. They weren't, they didn't have people in them. Uh, so it occurred to me, like in December, preparing for this show, uh, I, need to, I need to do something different. And I have created for that mission library show one piece with people in them. And it's the one back there with the Indians, and there's a procession of priests coming out of the church in the building of Mission San Antonio de Valero, what is now the Elm. So I thought, well, okay, I'm going to do these illustrations with people 
in the 18th century with friars and Indians. Um, and I'm going to open the doors. I'm going to open the doors because in the old missions there were just the buildings with just the closed doors. Well, by opening the doors, it occurred to me, I said, well, you know, I should have a light coming out. And by having the light coming out, it's got to be darker. So a lot of these images, I started to have to have images with sunsets or sunrises or, or in the evening. So that created, I, I was delighted that that created this illumination. Hence the name Illuminated Mystical Illustrations. Um, like for instance, the, the piece over here with the door entrance to uh, San Jose Mission with that ornate Baroque facade, uh, that, that I did initially with the doors and the windows closed. Well, when I opened it and created that illumination, I was like, wow, this looks really great as long as they so. <laughs> so uh, then it occurred to me to uh, have some uh, one image with the Indians actually not praying in, to, their Christ, to their Christian God, but to their ancestors. And that's what that piece in the back represents in front of the Mission San Antonio, the of the Alamo, with the doors closed. But, and you all know that in front of the Alamo, in fact, there was, a, there was a, uh, an article today about the burial site in front of the Alamo. And that's what they're doing. They're, they're praying to their ancestors in front of the burial sites, in front of Mission San Antonio de Valero, which is the Alamo. In some of these, in many of these pieces, they're my interpretation, uh, like the one at the end, at the middle there, where they're harvesting wheat by the mission. Uh, I did read one of your colleagues' uh, book, Jesus de la Teca, yes. uh, The Faces of Benjamin. Uh, where I learned a lot about the uh, San Antonio, Spanish San Antonio, back in the uh, 18th century, and learned that they did farm inside. I don't, I don't know if they did wheat, but that was my interpretation, uh, because I, I was going to do corn. But if I did corn, the corn was going to be taller than the people. So that was a design uh, piece. Uh, and many, in some of these uh, pieces, I'm the model. And Alexa Nalipa, who's a good friend of mine here, she's also a model in some of these pieces, and the rest are from photographs. All right. You may ask why I have these other pieces here on the uh, these biblical scenes. Well, I figured, well, I can't do, I can just do too many missions, and I figured, well, I already had this idea. This one piece over here, uh, it's called, and it was good. That piece over here. I had created for a St. Mary's University show titled, and it was good. So I got the inspiration to, to create some pieces in the Bible dealing with water. And that's why I have this piece here with Jonah and the fish, and of course, um, Jesus', Jesus baptism, the parting of the waters by Moses, and of course, Noah and the uh, flood. But uh, getting back to the technique, that's what some people have been curious about because why a mylar? Well, mylar lends itself very well to, to uh, the ink. And I use the pit of grass. It gets a pin. Uh, well, I'll show it to you in a little bit. In a little bit, when, when I'm, we're done, I'm going to go ahead and do some, some demonstrations in the back on how this is done. Okay? Uh, any questions? Are we making good time? <laughs> you want to get up to have a Yeah, we're doing good. We're doing good a lot. We, we can cover a lot. We can cover a lot. Any questions or anything? Yes? So why water? Why water? She's asked why water. Well, because this piece, the first one I did, uh, I liked my waves. I had done those waves for the first time, and I was like, oh, I love those waves. So I need to create some other pieces dealing with one. And uh, uh, this one here was the hardest one. Uh, uh, Moses part of the waters. I did this about three times because the waves 
at first looked like uh, like like aliens from another planet. And I, so I had to do it several times uh, in order to create that final image. And I got some inspiration from Japanese prints. But, any other questions? Oh, by the way, back there, there's two pieces of Mission Concepcion, and it's referred to as the double illumination. And that's going to happen next week of August 15th. And if you've never heard of it, uh, you know, these friars were very, very um, genius in calculating uh, the movement of the stars and the, the, the setting of the sun. But at between 6 and 7 o'clock on August 15th, the sun sets uh, as it's setting, the light is going into the oculus, the circular window, and, it, when, it, and when it hits that window, it, the, the ray falls on the painting of the Virgin Mary. And uh, it's, it's become a very popular event, and if you want to go, you better go wherever you can. It's a small church. So. Does, does that only happen once a year? It should happen February 15th, too, no? He's asking, does it happen just once a year or does it happen February 15th? I won't even know it to happen on August 15th. Yeah. You, you also have one over there, and I think it's San Jose, uh -huh. uh, the, going through the, is that, is that um, accurate too? Where it's shining on the... The, the one the that's mailer? on the mailer? Uh, no, that's... Uh, it's just the, the, the light from the sunset. Yeah, that coming, coming through the hole. The well, that's uh, that's from the church. I mean, that's the church, the, the church uh, candles coming, or uh, and that's why coming out of the church. Okay. Yeah. I forgot to mention one piece. Uh, I decided to do one piece of uh, in the 19th century, and it's the women uh, mourning after the fall of the Alma. And that's at least to the right of the uh, of the uh, fireplace. Um, and that was one of the hardest to do because I had to do a lot of, uh, of uh, broken rocks and, 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 and research. Uh, there's there's some Mexican soldier hats. I had to research what those soldier hats look like, uh, helmets look like. So. Okay, any other questions? Any comments? The light that comes to so beautifully, it's of course a beautiful image, but you're clearly implying the spiritual uh, features of this light, right? Okay, right. Yeah, she says the light that's coming out of these images, you're implying, of course, the spiritual images. Well, hence the name, spiritual visions. That was, uh, as I said earlier, when I started to create these and they're at sunset or sunrise uh, and illustrating the light coming on the said, well this is that has the spiritual effect. Uh, people have told me that this one over here where there's a monk uh, and a mystical woman that's that appears to be the most spiritual because he's having like a, a spiritual ecstasy if you will. Uh, and that's my interpretation. Um, so any other questions? Well, thank you very much for coming. I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm sure I'm very happy. And thank you again to Dr. Miguel Camino Hossa.